Well, brethren, we are beginning our penultimate message, which is the second last uh, message in uh, the series of messages on uh, Sola Gratia. And I will once again invite you to turn with me to uh, Titus and chapter 3. Titus and chapter 3. While you are turning there, let me quickly once again remind you of what we are doing here. In looking at the subject of uh, by grace alone, what we are primarily seeking to do is to remind ourselves of the gospel that saves. And that's a very important aspect of our Christian responsibility because the Christian faith is primarily there to salvage or to, to win back something that has gone wrong, that has been destroyed. And so this phrase, save or salvation, is such an important aspect of the Christian faith that once we lose it, we've literally lost the Christian faith. We are not here to, to be like a social club so that people can enjoy themselves. We are not there to, to simply make life better for people economically, um, educationally, um, medically, and whatever other means there might be, we are primarily there to bring a lost people back to God. And if we miss that, we've missed Christianity altogether. We are about the business of reconciliation, vertical reconciliation, that men and women might be reconciled to the living God. Everything else comes after that. And an important link in that reconciliation is the gospel. The gospel. The gospel. And that's why when we lose it, we've, we are doomed. And so we've been saying since the first day when I began preaching here, that it's our responsibility to define or to describe the gospel accurately. It's our responsibility to defend the gospel. And it's also our responsibility to declare it. And one of the ways, therefore, that we, we seek to do this is to gain a firm understanding of this message. And when we speak in terms of the five solas, this is simply one of the ways in which over time the Christian church has given us these pillars, these propositions that help to, to gain this clarity. And one of those pillars has been that of grace, that it is by grace alone. This is the fifth time I'm saying this. So I'm hoping by now it's, it's like, hey, can we now move on to the main message for today? We've heard it and heard it and heard it. But even tomorrow I'll repeat this. Because it's very easy for us to, to begin thinking that we're just dealing with something in a little corner somewhere. And yet on these pillars stand the eternal welfare of human souls because it's about salvation. And what we've done in the last few days is instead of dealing with this subject as a topic, we have been spending our time in Titus and chapter 3, beginning with the third verse, looking at the way in which grace is 
outworked in our salvation. Uh, we have seen um, where grace found us, how we were when grace reached out to us. We saw that in verse 3. We went on to see how grace reached out to us through a Savior's visit in verse 4. We went on to see how grace saves not through our own righteous works, but based squarely on the mercy, the sympathy, the compassion of God. We saw that um, again in, uh, in verse 5, the first part. And then we went on this morning to see uh, the, the actual mechanics, what, what actually happens when grace is saving us. And we saw there that it is through the working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit regenerates us, and in that regenerating work, the Spirit uh, washes us, renews us from the inside out. And consequently, we are a people that want to be reconciled to God. We are a people that want to do away with sin. We are a people that want holiness and so forth. That's what we saw uh, earlier today. And now we come into our fifth message our fifth message. And in that fifth message, we are now um, coming to verse um, 6, verse 6 into verse 7, verse 6 into verse 7, in which we are now seeing how grace brings to us justification by faith. Grace brings to us justification by faith. And so let us quickly read um, these verses that are there for us. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And here is what we are looking at now. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We'll end our reading there. We are now seeing something of the fruit of this grace. Yes, the mechanics had to do with the Spirit of God working in us, infusing the principle of life and infusing the spirit of uh, the, the uh, principle of holiness. The next step is that we are justified. So that being justified by his grace. That's the consequence of this. You remember one of the points I made earlier this morning was the fact that we, we tend often to put conversion 
and uh, the new birth in the reverse order. We tend to say to people um, that they must repent and believe in order to be born again. And I tried to show you in the last session that in fact it is the, the new birth, it is the, the being born again that produces the consequences of repentance and faith. And then from there comes the justification that we are looking at here. And it's important for us as Christians to, to maintain that balance. The new birth is not something we do. It's what God does to us. It's, it's a secret work of God's spirit that takes place somewhere inside, behind the scenes, in giving us life. What we do by way of our conversion is that we repent and we believe. It's not God who repents. We repent. It's not God who believes. We believe. And therefore, whoever is preaching the gospel to us, whoever is speaking to us, therefore, speaks not in terms of the fact that we need to do the new birth, but rather that we need to repent. We need to believe. And then the consequence of that, as I hope we will see, is justification. But let's quickly then spend our time just delving into this statement. First of all, you will notice that um, the Apostle Paul is using the word justified. Justified. This is a, a legal term. It's by legal, all I mean is that it, it, it happens in your records in a courtroom. It's not something that is happening in your heart. It's not you being changed. The change is what we looked at a few minutes ago, I mean, earlier today. Justification is in the courtroom. It's, it's somewhere in, as it were, the documents of God, the books in heaven, so to speak. And all it means is that a person is, listen to this, is declared to be righteous. Notice, he is declared to be righteous. He is not being made righteous. He's being declared to be righteous. That, that's what that phrase means. Notice, I've not said he is declared to be Forgiven. That's what I've said. I've said he is declared to be righteous. I'm deliberately separating these because often that's where our confusion lies. To many Christians, the word justification by faith is understood as simply meaning forgiven by faith. And yet, if we were to be strict with the word itself, to justify is not to forgive. To justify is to simply state that somebody is righteous. So let me use an obvious example here. If you find two people arguing and one of them is very angry and is now pointing a finger at his friend and he is saying, 
You see, the problem with you is you keep justifying yourself. That person who's angry and is pointing a finger at his friend is not saying that the problem with you is you keep forgiving yourself. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the problem with you is you keep saying that what you did was right. That's the problem with you. So the argument is not so much whether a person did something or not, but that he is saying that what he did was right, when really he must accept the fact that what he did was wrong. So to justify is, I repeat, to state that what somebody has done is right. Now the moment we understand it that way, suddenly this statement being justified becomes a big problem. It becomes a big problem because you don't justify sinners. You don't. Unless you are corrupt. So in a courtroom, if somebody did something that was wrong and the prosecution have proved it, that what a person did was wrong. He broke the law. If a judge then raises the gavel in the air and brings it crashing down, bang, and then says this person is acquitted, what he did was right, people will rise in disgust and they will walk out. They will say the judge is corrupt. Somebody would have bribed the judge. Because it's so obvious that this person broke the law. How can the judge say he is right? Well, friends, that's what God has done. Look with me quickly at Romans and chapter 4. Romans and chapter 4. Verse 5. Romans 4 and verse 5. Now, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. I'm interested in that little phrase there. To the one who does not work, but believes in him, meaning God, listen to this, who justifies the ungodly. Let's put in the definition there. Who declares righteous, the ungodly, the one who says that the ungodly is righteous. Now, that's a problem. It's a problem that needs to be processed. You see, if our understanding is this, that who forgives the ungodly, then there's no problem. Because it's simply telling us that he's got a large heart. And most of us do that, don't we? People wrong us and we forgive them. But to 
declare them righteous is something else. But that's what God does. That's what God does. How can he do that? How can a righteous God declare unrighteous people to be righteous? Back to our text. Titus chapter 3. There is a phrase that we could have easily missed. And it is the phrase, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. At the end of verse 6. Whom he poured out on us richly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. There is something Jesus did that enables a righteous God to declare sinners righteous. What did he do? We find it in chapter 2. Chapter 2 and verse 14. Chapter 2 and verse 14. Let's begin with the previous verse because we find the phrase there Again, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of, our, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we are told what he did. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. The word I'm looking for there is the word redeem. Redeem. To redeem means to buy back. That's what it means. To buy back. Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, he was buying us back. Jesus, never sinned. He lived an absolutely perfect life. He was born righteous, born of the Virgin Mary. Sin was not in his inheritance whatsoever. He then perfectly obeyed the law of God. In perfectly obeying that law, he merited a righteousness. Notice I said merited. In other words, he worked for it by his life. And then finally, setting aside that righteousness, he then took upon himself our debt, what we owed God the guilt of our sin. He took it upon himself. And on the cross, he paid the full price for our sin. The wrath of God that should have sunk us deeper than the grave into the flames of hell forever fell upon him until he cried, it is finished. He paid the price. His righteousness is now Free for those who trust in him. Let me say that again. His righteousness is free for those who trust in him. 
And therefore, when that righteousness becomes ours, God is able to declare us righteous. Not because we have done anything righteous. Not at all. But based on the righteousness of God's own son. Based on the righteousness of God's own son. It is the work of substitution that is unique only to the Christian faith. God the Son, who has always and ever been righteous, takes our sin upon himself and suffers for it to satisfy justice, to satisfy the wrath of God. Sinners who ought to perish take his righteousness upon themselves. And on that basis, God declares them righteous. Not on the basis of their own righteousness, because they have none, but based on the righteousness of God's own Son. And it's a real righteousness. It's a glorious righteousness. It is one that is absolutely without blame, without wrinkle, without any blemish. It's a perfect righteousness. So the judge of all the earth is able to make that declaration. He is righteous. Let him come into heaven itself. That's this justification here. Now, I've got no doubt that spiritual justification includes forgiveness. There's no doubt about it. The Bible does speak that God forgives us. But, I want to repeat, when we equate it to forgiveness, we miss the glory of what the Christian faith is about. It's beyond forgiving. It is declaring us righteous. Now, for those of us who did a bit of mathematics at school. You will remember that we, we learned about graphs, and graphs would have an axis under which you were in the negative. You were below zero. And then on top, you were in the positive. In many ways, forgiving is the fact that we've done something wrong, we are in the negative, and when you are forgiven, you are brought to zero. So what you did wrong is pardoned. Justification takes you into the positive. It's a righteousness which is not your own, which is given to you, by God. So the problem with equating justification with forgiveness is that you end up with Christians simply arriving at zero. What you did wrong has been removed. That's not where Christianity ends. Sorry, it goes beyond that. You are not only forgiven, you are given a righteousness that's not your own. A righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let me go further. You are not only forgiven, you are given an infinite righteousness. Because Jesus is God. 
And so you have a glorious righteousness that is given to you freely. I'm almost being tempted to go to that last phrase that speaks about the hope of eternal life. Because ultimately, it gives you a solid hope. You know that when the last day comes, when you stand before this righteous, infinitely righteous God to be judged by him, dressed in the righteousness of Jesus, there's no need to tremble. No need to tremble. Because you are dressed in the righteousness of God's own son. So this justification, justification must be allowed to be justification. Not just forgiveness, but being declared righteous and it is being declared righteous by God forever. Because God's righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus, will never diminish it will never become less. It's of such value that you can be assured that in it you are safe and secure. Now, the Apostle Paul, back to our text, finally tells us how on earth we can receive such an overwhelming gift from God. And he says, it is by his grace. Let's go back to the text. He says there, so that being justified by his grace, by his grace, Grace, which is what we're really looking at this week. Sola gratia, by grace alone. We're justified by his grace. Remember on the first day I told you that the Apostle Paul has been deliberately throwing in the attributes of God's goodness as he has been taking us through these verses. We began with the goodness of God in which he then spoke about his loving kindness. And then we went on to talk about his mercy. And now he has reached that word, grace. Grace. Unfortunately, again, in many Christian minds, the word grace simply means love. That's all it means. For many people, the word grace simply means that he is loving. Again, if that's the way you understand grace, you are robbing yourself of appreciating what God has done for you. Because, yes, it's part of God's goodness, but grace is not simply God having mercy on people. It is God having mercy on people who deserve his wrath. Add that last part. Who deserve his judgment. That's what grace is. Let me use an obvious example. If you were passing through um, 
one of these difficult residential areas in our city of Lusaka in Zambia, where there is a lot of crime. And we're passing there at night. And some bad gun that's full of drug activities pounced on you. And they began to, to beat you up and pull out your wallet and everything from your pocket in order to rob you. If I then showed up, and let's just suppose I knew Kung Fu, which I don't know, by the way. But let's assume I knew Kung Fu. And not just Jiu-Jitsu, but Kung Fu. And I jumped in and elbowed these individuals and kicked them in the face. And they all ran away. And then I took you to a nearby hospital. And I paid your bills. When your friends and relatives come, you would say to them, that man is really loving. He's a loving individual. He, he came into my situation and helped me. He's merciful. That's what you would say. You would not say he's gracious. You would say he's merciful, he's loving, he, he's good, he, he had compassion on me, sympathy, so he's merciful. But let's go back to the story once again. Let's suppose that the day before this event happened in Lusaka, I was wearing my brand new three-piece suit. And I was making my way to my daughter's wedding. You saw me, and as I was passing by a pool of muddy water, you came in your car. And deliberately, you saw me. You came and skidded with your car on that muddy water. And that terrible water came onto my three-piece suit. And you drove a little distance, came out of your car, and started laughing at me. And old man as I am, with my fury, I began to run towards you. You jumped into your car and you disappeared. Okay? Keep that in mind. Fast forward the next day. And I see you being beaten up. And I begin coming towards you. When you see me and you recognize me, you are thinking, oh, oh. He's going to join these guys to finish me off. Especially when you see me going like this. But if in the process I beat up those rowdy guys and they run away, I give you back your money, I take you to the hospital, I pay your bills. When I'm about to say bye, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't think he recognized me. Praise God, he doesn't recognize me. Because in your heart you're thinking, if he recognized me, there's no way he can do what he has done. No way. And then, as I am about to go out of that door, I turn around and say, next time you see an old man like me in a three-piece suit, don't do what you did, okay? And then I go away. You go. <gasps> so he knew who I was. When your relatives come, you won't just say, 
He's a good man. He's a loving man. He's a merciful man. You will say he's a gracious man. He's gracious. He's one who has overlooked what I did in order to be a blessing to me. He is a gracious man. Now friends, that's what we have here. We, we know, we, we, we've reached the, 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 the apex, the, the height of the goodness of God. It's not just love and mercy. It, it's, it's grace that he has had upon us. Because we deserve the opposite. We, we, we broke his laws. We, we've raised our fists in his face. We, we, we have deliberately been in disobedience and in rebellion against him. That's what we've been. And despite this God, knowing all that, he takes his own son, his, his darling, God the Son, and puts him in our place and makes him to, to suffer the wrath of just, a just God in our place. And then gives us his righteousness instead. That's grace. That's much less grace. That's glorious grace. That's infinite grace. This God did not need us at all. At a click of his finger, he would have recreated the entire universe and put a new humanity there. But because of who he is, remember, it's his character. We've been looking at, he's a good God. He shows the apex of his goodness by giving us a free righteousness at the expense of himself. We who are rebels, absolute rebels, in order to bring us to himself. Amazing. Amazing. And that's why this, the Christian message, is such a glorious message because of these realities that God justifies the ungodly. He, he justifies us by his grace. And indeed, by grace alone. It's completely an unmerited favor. We've already seen this. We don't throw in our own good works. We've thrown that out already. Not by righteous works, but by his own free mercy. By his own free mercy. I need to just handle one more matter as we rush on to close. And it is this. How does this justification then become ours. What is, as it were, the cup by which we receive this justification? The general teaching of the Bible is that it is by responding in repentance and faith by responding to the good news in repentance and faith. We see this right through the Gospels. 
we see this right into um, the, the book of Acts, and we see this right through the epistles. The message over and over and over again is that this message of God to us is one that we receive through being repentant and trusting. For instance, in Luke 24, the Lord Jesus Christ is about to ascend to heaven and is talking about how men and women are to benefit from the death that he has just gone through. Remember, he will use the word forgive, but that's simply the beginning of the benefits. We have said it is not just forgiveness, it includes the positive, which is being dressed in his own righteousness. But all the same, I want us to see this. Um, uh, Luke 24, and um, I begin reading from verse 46. And Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, The Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that here it is, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. So it's very clear that repentance is a requirement. Repentance is a requirement. But perhaps if we can quickly jump to Romans 5, uh, we have the... And verse 1, we have the, uh, the statement that is a very clear one. Romans 5 and verse 1. Romans 5 and this one. It says, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you find that again and again in the Bible, through the Gospels, through the book of Acts, and right into the epistles, that the message of the preacher is not simply God has done this for you, rejoice and run away with it. It was... Therefore, you must turn away from everything you know to be evil. And then, you must put your trust in the person and work of Christ. So you turn away from what you know to be evil and cling to the cross of Christ. And God bestows on you this justification. Now, again, you know, us as human beings, we, we always want somehow to, to squeeze in good works. And we, we, we almost begin to, to make repentance and faith into some meritorious activity. You know, I, I, I believed, I believed. And, you know, there's, there's some sign of, of pride there. You know, I believed. That's why I'm a Christian. That is simply the, the begging bowl in which God bestows his blessing. It's not something that we should even be, as it were, conscious of in terms of, you know, what I did, you know, this is what I did, this is what I did. No, we concentrate more on what he did in sending a savior to come in and rescue me from death, from death. It's like an individual, the example we used on the first or second day about uh, a person who's drowning and finally someone dives in and 
fishes him out. And then he's being asked, so how, how were you rescued? And he starts talking about himself. Eh? Well, I, I held on to, I held, no man, what holding on? It's the person who dived in, who held on to you, that rescued you. You should be speaking more in terms of, he rescued me. He dived in. If he hadn't done it, I would perish. Or, let's use another example, which is more uh, familiar to people in my part of the world. Uh, there is a famine in the land, maybe due to a long civil war or due to drought, and they, there's just no food in an entire region, and, and people are, are starving, little babies are just skin and skeleton. And then a United Nations aeroplane comes in full of food. And everybody is told to line up. And you come from your house with a big bowl and you line up. And finally, in that queue, you reach the point where the United Nations um, rescue individuals pour in the rice and whatever other things might be there by way of food. And finally, you get home with this bowl full of food and your family, they are all rejoicing. Finally, we've got food. And your children say, Daddy, how did you get this food? And all you speak about is, well, you know, I held out my bowl. That's how I got this food. The older children will say, come on, Daddy. Tell us, how did you get the food? Because they'll know that simply holding out a bowl doesn't fill it with food. Some people raised the money, filled an entire aeroplane with food, flew it across an entire ocean, landed it safely. Your raising the ball was simply that connection. That's all it was. That connection. Into which the food So yes, we respond to the gospel through repentance and faith. But Lord, not anybody ever cheat you that repentance and faith is what did it. It was simply the means by which we receive this great and glorious benefit of salvation this great and glorious justification. We have been justified by faith. Grace secures our justification. We thank God that the God who sits on the throne of the entire universe is a gracious God. And because of his grace, we are justified. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the fact that you are a good God, a loving God, a kind God, a merciful God, and indeed a gracious God. As we have seen today, we we do not deserve even the least of what has come to us. 
It would have been enough if you had simply thrust us into some corner of the universe. Out of your sight because of our sin and yet out of hell we would have been grateful. But Lord, for you to pay the price that we owed by the sacrifice of your own son, giving us a full and free righteousness by which you declare us to be righteous, despite all that we have done against you, Oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And how we pray that that gratitude will only grow the more we meditate on these stupendous facts and that it will completely overwhelm us when we arrive in eternity. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.